Okay. All right, we are recording. Welcome everyone to Burgess Power Hour. Those of you on the phone, those of you on Zoom, those of you with video, without video, hey, we're all connected, right? So I just want to give a shout out for all of you taking the time to be with us tonight. It's going to be um, quite an adventure this evening, I think, because of the topic. Uh, and it's going to be a little different. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Burge Smith Lyons, and I've been doing uh, these types of transformational workshops in the world for 37 years, so I'm old. Um, and essence of being, I've been doing all of our programs all around the world on six different continents for 27 years. So, hey, those of you who are graduates of Essence of Being in our Conscious Leadership Academy, welcome, welcome, welcome. I see many of you here. And those of you who are brand new, never seen me before, welcome. And those of you who have seen me before, but just haven't quite connected on other levels with me on any of our workshops, welcome as well. Okay. So I just want to uh, start out tonight letting you know that um, tonight's going to be about the subconscious beliefs around race and prejudice. I figured that'd be a good discussion to have. Now, most of the time when I do power hours, it's basically me yakking for a minute and then we do an exercise and you get to explore a lot of things about yourself and then we talk about it and people share some things and then I give you a couple of tools to use based on whatever comes up for people, okay? And then I tell you what's going to be coming up next that we can all connect with. Tonight we're going to be, it's going to be similar, however, I really encourage all of us to um, make sure you have a pencil and a paper. I am going to be um, uh, delving into the subconscious because that's what I do, right? So part of this is really you being truthful and honest with yourself. And please uh, be mindful that um, whatever comes up for you during these processes is an awareness for you, okay? And I just want to set the parameters of our sharing because I, I'm going to let us share a lot more than I normally do because I think we might have some sharing to do, okay? And uh, hopefully nobody will, I'm sure, I see all the people here. I know you guys are going to talk, so I'm not concerned. All right. So I, I know many of you you're, you, you're not shy to share. So I just want to set some parameters that... Um, this is not a forum uh, for any kind of hate or right or wrong or uh, trying to convince others that they're wrong and you're right, okay? And, and trying to convince people of your opinions and your thoughts and things. It's not about that tonight. It's more about a deep dive into your own subconscious in order to be aware of maybe some things you weren't aware of and maybe be a little more aware of your subconscious beliefs around prejudice and race. So we're going to be talking and sharing tonight with that lens, okay, around judgment and race and um, prejudice. So my intention is that we become more aware and inspired to act or behave or think differently if it doesn't serve you any longer. Okay, just to kind of be open to whatever comes out tonight in our conversation and in your deep dive about what's going on in your head, okay, and in your heart. And if, if you find out some things that aren't serving you as well anymore uh, to, to make yourself happy, uh, I encourage you to be open to shifting that and stay in that love thought system. Does anybody have any questions about any of that before we start? Okay, I'm gonna, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to unmute everybody, but uh, please mute yourself if you've got background noise, because I do want to be able to hear you, but not the background, okay? And if I hear a lot of background, I'm just going to have to mute you. And if you're on the phone, hit star six or mute, okay? Hopefully you've got paper and pencil, because we're going to go into fear and love. And I said love thought system, and you might be saying, Burge, what's love thought system? This is the part where you say, Burge. Okay, anyway. Can't, gotta lead them to water here. Hey, hey, hey Burge. Yes. Hey, Burge. 
Hey, what's the love thought system? I'm glad you asked, Regina. Okay, girl, you got it going on. All right. So it's the opposite of fear thought system, right? So fear can separate us. Fear separates us and it keeps us playing small sometimes. All right. So the fear can be, and many may have heard this before, uh, that fear can stand for false evidence appearing real. And if you've never heard that before, even if you have, sometimes we get really ingrained in a way that we believe, in the way that we think, in the way that we act. And we, we find evidence that all of it's real. Our fears are very real. We find evidence all of our life. And so let me explain to you what this really means about false evidence appearing real, which can mean fear. It's like when you're a kid and you're saying, mommy, daddy, there's a monster under my bed. There's a monster under my bed. What is, is there really a monster under the bed? No. To that child, is it real? Absolutely. So what does mommy or daddy do? They come in and they show the child, look, honey, no, look under the bed. There's no monster there. There's a lot of dust, but no monster. Okay. And so the child gets new evidence that it's not real. Sure smells real. Sure looks real. Sure has been my life up until now real. Because that's what we do is we look for evidence to prove ourselves right. And that's great. If it's working for you, great. Okay. But if it's not working for you, you might want to look at new evidence. So that's what I mean by false evidence appearing real, because it sure smells real and it sure has been our experience, right? And it, it's real until it's not. And so what I encourage us to do is to look for new evidence that perhaps something can shift. There is definitely a shift going on in the world right now in all kinds of ways with the whole pandemic, with all the uprisings and the awarenesses that are happening and we're waking up to different things that maybe we haven't talked about. Um, certainly not in this depth for a long time. So I just want to show you that the fear thought system can also mean a fear can mean forgetting everything is all right. Okay. So fear, the fear thought system is ego based. It finds fault with people. It attacks. It believes in scarcity. That there's not enough. And if it's a me or you world, by God, it's going to be me. Unless you're really codependent, and then it's going to be here, I'll give it to you. Okay. Um, fear thought system is a conditional, for, conditional forgiver. <coughs> I forgive you, you son of a bitch, but you better not do that again. That's a conditional forgiver, okay? Um, they, people that are in the fear thought system, just notice uh, if you find conflict a lot or if you find yourself separate a lot, okay? Separation can be living in the fear thought system. Uh, right now, I know we're separated for a lot of reasons. <laughs> right now, a little more than usual, I get it. However, it's always a choice. We're always at choice. Okay, about what we can, how we can believe and feel about each other. Okay, uh, we'd rather be right than happy. Robert likes that one. We'd rather be right than happy. That can show you that perhaps you're in the, the fear thought system. Hey, Leslie. Hey, Luana. Hey, Arlene. Here's Denise and Michael. I'm seeing more people pop up in Mercedes. Okay. Um, also, the fear thought system is the guilt. The, basically, if you feel guilt or if you're throwing uh, shame at somebody, you catch it. That's also the fear thought system. So be mindful if you're doing that. It's sort of like, that's okay. I'll sit in the corner in the dark. No worries. You go out and have a good time without me. It's all right. Go ahead. So that is throwing guilt and people catch the shame. And just notice if that's you. You know, if you, and many of us go into that fear thought system and come out of it and go into the love thought system. But this is just to give you a guide as to where's my head right now? What is, where's my heart? 
am I living out of ego right now? Or am I living out of love, which is based with our values? It's value based from the great spirit, from God, from the universe, okay? From whatever you want to call that, that higher power or that connection that we all belong to and that we all can connect with. Um, so a love thought system, they seek harmony. They're love seekers. They believe in abundance. They are unconditional forgivers. Uh, they love unity and seek unity and harmony. And they'd rather have peace of mind. And they'd rather be happy than right. So that gives you a kind of a, a guideline difference of what is love thought and what is fear thought. Does that help? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go in and find out some subconscious beliefs around race and prejudice right now. So the reason why we do this, I call it our bubble talk. Okay, it's the, the bubble talk is that little bubble above your head, like a little cartoon character. And that's our subconscious belief that may or may not be serving us. Okay, and if our conscious thoughts and our subconscious thoughts are not aligned, then we can have blocks come up that we're not even aware of. We might not be able to create abundance or create uh, harmony or create wonderful relationships or any of the things that are purpose in life because maybe our subconscious is blocked and it's blocked and not aligned with what we really want, we say we want consciously. And it's subconscious. You don't walk around thinking this, okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go in and find your bubble talk because one of my favorite quotes about this is from James Baldwin, and he says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So let's go face it. Let's see, what, let's see what's going on with our subconscious. So I encourage all of us to ask these questions listen to the uncomfortable answers that might come up to challenge our status quo, okay? So with that, I'm going to give you statements and I just want you to fill in the blank. And I want you to do a stream of consciousness writing. And what that means is you just think of the first thing that comes up. You know, you can write one or two things if you want. Whatever comes up, don't edit it, don't think about it, don't try to figure it out, don't don't want to say the right answer, just the very first thing that comes into your head, okay? And so you're going to write one or two answers, just first things. And remember, we're doing this from the sense of, uh, from the filter and the lens of race and prejudice, all right? Just to see what's there. Anybody have any questions about how we're going to do it? Is that cool? Okay. All right, so here we go. My mom believed or believes people of color are what? My mom believed or believes people of color are first thing that comes up. If you don't know, make it up. Okay. And the next one. My mom believed or believes white people are first thing that comes up. My mom believed or believes that white people are Don't think about it too hard. Just write it down first thing. If you don't know, make it up. And the next one is, my dad believed or believes people of color are My dad believed or believes people of color are. Okay. 
And the next one is, uh, my dad believes or believed white people are What'd you hear your dad say? My dad believed or believes white people are what? What'd you hear? Okay, and the next one is, just notice if what you're feeling right now, by the way. Okay, just notice if it's comfortable, uncomfortable. What are you thinking? How are you feeling? Just take a deep breath. Most of my friends in high school were what? Most of my friends in high school were Now this might trigger you guys, but I'm gonna try it anyway. The next one is, when I'm stopped by police, my first thought is, when I'm stopped by police, my first thought is what? First thing. And the next one is, and this just write down the first thing, it may or may not have anything to do with race, but I'm going to say it. Rich people are, rich people are what? First thing. And I'm not using these terms in a derogatory term. I'm just using them as a, as a way for you to have a distinction. And the next one is poor people are, poor people are what? And the next one, when I feel attacked, I, when I feel attacked, I, what do you do? And the last one, take a deep breath. <sighs> when I feel judged, I, when I feel judged, I what?
Okay, so just in case you didn't write down the questions, the first one was my mom believed or believes people of color are. The next one's my mom believed or believes white people are. Then dad believed, believes people of color. Dad believed or believes white people. The next one was most of my friends in high school were what? The next one was when I'm stopped by police, my first thoughts, or my first thought is. And the next one I said was rich people are. The next one is poor people are. And the next one I wrote was when I feel attacked, I, and when I feel judged, I just so you can kind of remember what I said, okay? So this will be the time that we will uh, open it up to share. Uh, any awarenesses, ahas, anything that was striking? Did you notice any similarities between you and your mom and dad? Did you, um, have anything? Hey, so this is Trish. Hey. hey. So I had the exact opposite reaction to my parents. Both of my parents were, my mother, I know better. I know my mother really well because she lived till she was 80. My father was about 47 when he died. So I don't know him as well, but they were both bigots. My mother was a big bigot. I mean, it was obvious. Even when she was sick and I was hiring a nurse, she told me, I don't want a black nurse. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with you? So I am exactly the opposite, and their reaction to race made me more militant. More well, militant. That's, that's, that's the truth, and I know that. I know that. I was so, I was so uh, disgusted by their reaction to people of color, yet they both had people of color as friends. Go figure. I, I just never understood it. Well, when you say militant, what do you mean? You became militant. You became... I became exactly the opposite. Like, I have my whole life fought for civil rights and human rights and women's rights, and I am exactly the opposite that my mother was. Okay. So, so it, it definitely affected me. And what were most of your friends in high school? white because I went to a Catholic high school um, and most of the school was white. There were, uh, I went to school in New York, so I had a small contingent of black people, a small, a bigger contingent of Hispanic actually, uh, but most of my friends were white in high school. Okay. But I think that in high school, my friends, we were really oblivious, like because we lived in New York and it was so integrated. I mean, I took the subway to school every single day. And I mean, it was my life was there were people of all colors, Asian, black, you know, everybody was part of my life. And I had friends, all different friends, all different colors. And most of my friends predominantly were white because I lived in a white neighborhood and I went to a white high school. Gotcha. So what about when I feel judged? Oh, when I feel judged, my initial reaction is I get pissed off, but then I go inward. Then I go inward. And I just had a recent experience with it because I'm doing a, I'm doing a series, a weekly series called Sister to Sister. And I'm having conversations with women that I know of color to just ask them to share their experiences so that people can actually hear what it's like to be a black woman in America today. So, um, for me, it's, it's, uh, I was judged on Facebook. Like people were saying the rudest things to me because I was using terms they were uncomfortable with, like white privilege. And, you know, I'm doing a lot to educate myself. And Women's Prosperity Network is really opening this door for conversation because I think that's the only way that things are going to change is one-to-one, -one, person to person. So I was really get. I got somebody who wrote on there, oh, I'm sorry to see you drank the Kool-Aid, Trish. 
Like, what the hell does that mean? So I, I, I go, I get pissed, but then I pull back because I know it's better to consider my response. So I go inward and I consider how can I answer this and stay calm and cool because if I come across and just want to, what I want to do and excuse my language is I want to call them ignorant assholes, but I know that's not going to get me anywhere. That's stooping to their level. So I go inward after my original getting pissed off. And that is exactly how you felt when you were, you became the vigilante, right? You became the, the, uh, what did you call yeah, it? The, the, yeah, militant, rebel. My, my sister, Susan, coined me the revolutionary. So all of my business stuff, I'm the revolutionary, I'm, you know, the results revolutionary. All my company is called Re- Revolutionary Results because inwardly I'm, and outwardly I'm a revolutionary. I want change. I don't like what I see, and when I don't like it, I want to speak out about it. And so the judgment piece, that'll be your first response or reaction is being, um, you know, is fighting and wanting to. Angry. 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 Yes, I get angry. Okay. But I don't, but I don't react angry. I know better. I'm older now, right? When I was a youngster, I would immediately fly off the handle, but I've learned to hold that back and to instead garner my thoughts and answer intelligently because I know calling someone an ignorant asshole only adds fuel to the fire. <laughs> a, little sure. a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, but you're being real, so I appreciate you sharing that. Does anybody else have anything they want to share? What, what I'd like to share. This is Darlene. Darlene. Hold on. I've got Darlene and I've got Josette. Is that right? Yes. Okay, let's do Josette and then Darlene. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, so when you talk about like, um, you talk about what my mom thought about people of color, she thought they were beautiful and powerful, whereas she thought um, white people were conniving. And then my father thought people of color were not to be trusted, and he thought, white people were the group to connect with. Wow, so you had complete opposites growing up. Correct. And then all my friends in high school were white because I grew up um, African-American kid in a white suburb in Colorado. And so out of my, definitely out of my high school, 1,500 kids, there were maybe nine black people or people of color. But my friends were white, so I didn't really know anything differently. So did you feel um, judged or attacked? Um, Not necessarily. Um, You know, I think I've had instances where that has come up. And I pretty much kind of, I think I just kind of internalized it. Didn't didn't always understand it per se, because, but... I, I kind of took it, you know, within. So let me ask you a question. Which of your parents have you started, uh, which beliefs have you taken on? Um, which beliefs have I taken on? Well, I still think people of color are beautiful and powerful. Yes. Um, however, I probably have lived the life that my father talks about because I'm black, my husband is white, my kids are mixed. Okay, and so you have, and you were around a lot of white people too when you were growing up too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, but I mean, you know, that was kind of the environment that I grew up with, and then as I got older, the circles that I seemed to be more attracted to were uh, were the circles that had white people. Okay. And just real quick, I have curiosity about rich people are and poor people are. Um, well, I said rich people are mainly white and poor people um, are minorities and PWT, but that's kind of how I was taught, sorry. Okay, and so this is totally in alignment with the way that you 
uh, that your dad, the reason why he said go toward the white people. Right. And so this is something that was passed on. This belief system was passed on. And if it's working for you, that's great. But it's interesting to see how we take on our parents' beliefs, our society's beliefs, and they, it's this, it, it's, it's total, it's eternal. Our beliefs are eternal until, until we re-believe something. So if it's been working for you this way, then that's great. But it's interesting to see that that's a very, you are very clear about white people are rich and poor people are not. And poor people are uh, not white. So, well, I mean, but it's, that's, my experience has been traveling all around the world that that is a belief as well for a lot of people. And those are handed down. And you get to look at the evidence. Mm -hmm. and the system, you know, and you can talk about system, all the system and everything, how it's raised uh, and created it so that that's the way it is. And so I'm hoping that many of us are, are once again, opening our eyes or maybe for the first time about how this works and if this is okay good anything else just that before we go to Darlene thank you okay that's a really great perspective you've got both sides going on uh Darlene um well my, it was hard for me to answer. Uh, my mother was never prejudiced uh, that at least not that I knew. And my father left. I, I was never didn't have a man in the home for most of my young life. And I got married at 16. So um, I was never raised with any black uh, people. Our school had no black children in it. Uh, the black children in Melbourne, if they went to the movie, they went upstairs. I, so I was never, I didn't really have an opinion, except I was friends with the black cheerleaders that had, you know, went to a different school and uh, they would come in the dime store where I worked and uh, we would talk about our football games and stuff. So I don't think that I ever really became a more aware of, of all of those differences. I didn't really had a view because my mother, we lived in Texas, so we were we with more Mexicans than we were, or Hispanic or uh, Indian in Texas than I did black people. But she, I remember even back back then there were uh, there was always some either black or uh, Spanish people, and she never had opinions. She was, you know, she hugged them. They brought us food. We brought them, made them stuff, and took them. So I don't even think I formed an opinion. <laughs> I was married to a man that was very prejudiced though. So I, I, him and I argued a lot about his opinions, you know, which that never does any good, you know, because people have them for various reasons. Um, I never, um, I, I don't, I don't think, and you know, the injustices that I have seen, like one time I was waiting on two little uh, black girls that came in the drugstore, and, and my boss came like a maniac across the floor saying get those little um black children off those stools and I said what and he says they're not supposed to be sitting there that was back where I guess black people didn't come in I never re I was in my own little you know high school world you know cheerleading and never gave it a thought but I knew that wasn't right I I, I was like what are you talking about there I said he they're just sitting there and he had a fit about it, but that's, I'm sure, his bigoted way that they were raised, you know, was just acceptable back. This is back in the 50s. So, you know, we're talking <laughs> in the olden days, old, old, old days. Right. And so and later in, in life, I mean, I've never given it as much thought because the black people that I'm around are extremely successful. They go to my church that I know. I mean, they've got big, high positions. There's a, a not a huge number of them, so I, I I don't know. I don't like what's going on, you know, the rioting and all that kind of stuff. I it really bothers me. I want I want to just cry, um, but I, I I think um, I haven't been out in the world like Trish to want to fight about it or. Um, 
I would want to be, I, I, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a person that believes that fighting and uh, being, um, you know, obnoxious about something never gets anything uh, accomplished. It's like, I, you know, I've been to, is, uh, to Israel and there's so much um, uh, prejudice against Jewish people for many, many reasons, you know. Well, you're a Jew, you're, I mean, what is that? I don't think I ever really had time. I got married so young and had children. I don't think I really had time to form a bunch of hardcore prejudices. Well, so I, uh, what I'm hearing you say is that, yeah. What I'm hearing you say is that for the, all these beliefs that came up for you, that you don't understand why people feel the way they do sometimes, and but yet you don't want to, what, what's the word you used, want to um, fight, and it makes you cry. So the part about speaking up and having a voice that part I don't have. I mean, as far as uh, just say what's going on now, because that's really my my husband was a police officer in Melbourne, Florida during uh, the riots here in the late 60s. So, you know, he told me many stories, but he was he had uh, three of his very good friends were black police officers and they came to our house and we were we were friends with them. And but the the rioting that he went through when they would drive in the towns and they would try to pick the cars up and throw them and they were told not to shoot them, uh, but they they were all feared for their lives. So he was very anti that. I don't think black in general, but those blacks, the ones that were, you know, I don't know, causing trouble or being in. Okay. You're, you're, <laughs> um, so, uh, I need to stop you. As you're, I, I don't know. I think he was more, he's brought up in West Virginia, so I would say more prejudiced than normal. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Because I, uh, you're, you're I can't, messing up there a little bit but okay. oh i know well i can't hear you either i don't know what's wrong with my phone now can you hear now i i can hear you okay. in a second okay so i encourage you to continue to have it to use your voice and speak up when you see injustice for sure um and definitely it's a subconscious belief that you've had about you know that's just the way it is and that's and back in the in the specific time period you're talking about you know, it's sort of like with, uh, it was okay to sexually abuse women too, you know, and to not abuse, but it was okay. Yeah. There, there are a lot of things that were okay. Well, they really, they really weren't okay, but you just didn't, it's I think they accepted, just you know? didn't, yeah. Yeah, it was accepted. I think that's what uh, the thing you know, they were just accepted. But even in in these times, in my business, I've had many come in. Now we're talking about racial, but we're also talking, I've had people come in and say, I don't want no gay guy doing my hair, or I don't want a black person doing my hair. We have a um, an um, Indian girl that works for me. And uh, we've had several in these days, in time right now, come in and say, you know, I don't, I don't put them working on me. Strange. Uh, you. They're very blunt and say horrible things. Like you said, what Trish, Trish has gone through on the inner, uh, on Facebook. What, what the heck? She's trying to find out stuff. Why would anybody have a problem with that? Okay. And that's because of belief systems that were handed down to them and they got to see evidence of things, right? Yeah. Not be it's fear. It's fear too. Just fear of what we think is going to happen. There's fear and there's love, right? There's two. Yes. Sides. If you want yes. both, you can go back and forth. Okay, Darlene, thank you for sharing, honey. I want to give some other people a chance. Yes, please. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for doing this. You're welcome. Uh, did um did did um, I can share? Who's that? Lynn. Hey, Lynn. Go for it. Hi. Well, actually, it was very difficult for me, Burge, because both my mother and my father died when I was young. 
So my mother, I was six when my mother died and I was 10 when my father died. And in my family, we never discussed race. I mean, we saw on TV what was happening in the um, early 60s on TV in Alabama and, you know, Selma and things of that nature, but we never had a real discussion of it. My aunt moved us to a suburb that was, pri when we moved there was primarily white, but quickly changed over. And I do remember like at six years old asking why were all the white people moving on our street? And she explained to me that they didn't want to live around us. And my thing was, but well, we're okay people, why not? Because I just didn't understand it at that age. But to answer your questions, for my father, I put down, and my father always believed that people of color could do great things. And that white people were capable of being your friends because he had friends. He was friends with his bosses and things of that nature. But growing up, it, it turned out that because my school, the neighborhood changed so fast, that most of my friends in school were black. We had only a few whites that went to our school. One white um, woman, I remember, he left and went to a camp and she came back like a semester later. And we're like, why are you back? She said, because they kept saying, you live around black people? So other than that, we really never had discussions about it. And then I went to Brandeis, which was a predominantly white Jewish school. They had very few blacks. So. And therefore? And therefore, I was then in the minority. You know, and so it took, it was a little, it was a little culture shock for me. Because not only was I, in a minority where I had, you know, I mean, and I'll be honest, I had a white roommate assigned to me and I decided I didn't want it. I did not want that. I wanted to live with a black student. Probably the worst decision I ever made. <laughs> I figured out, but, but, you know, and that was a big lesson for me though, because that's when I learned that it really isn't about the race of the person there. You know, you can have crazy people, all colors, so, <laughs> and that's, and so, and then I actually really gotten to know the person. Right. And so that was a life lesson for you about definitely it's not about the skin color. However, right. it's interesting how we do pick, right? If we had to pick, you know, oftentimes we're af maybe not afraid, but it's just different. You know, it's like people are different and anybody who's different, it's like, I'd rather be with people that are like me. Right. Yeah. And so that's how maybe our innate responses are, even if it was our belief system from being raised that way or not. But it's interesting how you said, I wanted to choose that, but then you realized, oh, what a great, what a great lesson for you about, about that. And so do you feel uh, judged being a black woman in the world? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And so... Tell us more about that. Well, it's well, it depends on who it, who it is that you're around. But yeah, I feel like you know my qualifications. It doesn't matter. You know, I've had judges like ask me, "Oh, well, what law school did you go to? You're so articulate." Like, well, I went to law school. I should be articulate. Most people that go to law school should end up being articulate. But you know, I I know he didn't ask everybody that or people in a courtroom, I'll be in a courtroom and have a white attorney come in and ask me something, thinking I'm the clerk. We all have these perceptions. Or not thinking there was any way I could be an attorney. Yeah, but the worst one, to be honest, was I was in Tallahassee about to argue before the Florida Supreme Court. First time I'm in my power suit, I'm ready. I'm at the hotel. I'm going to get breakfast and I'm in the restaurant and a woman walks up to me and says, do y'all have any more fruit in the back? And I kind of looked and said, well, this is this the uniform they wear now. Because she thought I was working. 
at the hotel. And I'm thinking, I'm about to go argue before the Florida Supreme Court. But this woman only could see me as to help. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so what is your response to that, dear? Well, I tell you, I what I said to her was basically that. Oh, is this what the, the waitresses are wearing now? No, I mean, in general, what is your response when people judge you that way? That's basically my response to it usually in those kind of situations where it's a, a quick one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I, I try not to, like the guy in the, in the courtroom that said that to me, I thought I was the clerk. And then when the judge came out and said, Ms. Whitfield, do you have a matter before me? I handled my matter. I just told him I didn't know. That was my answer to his question. Yeah. But when the judge called on me and I took care of my business and on my way out and he ran after me and and, you know, it was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I see yeah, you need to think about that. You know, the fact that you couldn't see me as being anything other than somebody, you know, less than you, not on your same level. That's your issue. It's not mine. Good. Um, so, so when people project, and this is for all of us, when people project a certain I idea of who we are and they judge us for white, black, red, yellow, female, male, and they judge us and they can be gay or not gay. They judge us for who we, they think we are. And they project their own fears and their own belief systems onto us. And so the question is, how do we respond to that? You know, and how can we educate and stand up and have a voice and without um, causing any kind of um, I'm not even sure what to say the word is, but how do we respond in a way that is something that people can hear, you know, and I feel like what's happening in the world right now is where we have an opportunity to it's like what Trish said, we have an opportunity to have a conversation about it. And this happens to all of us that we get projected upon right about all kinds of things. And how do we respond to that? Because that's not who we are. You know, and, and I can't even imagine what it feels like to be a black person or a brown person or a gay person or, uh, you know, any kind of different person that I am. I, I can empathize with everybody, but until you walk in the shoes, you know, it's good to have a conversation at least about what your life been like. And I feel like it's important for us to be open to listening, you know, to that. And how, and how do we all respond in kind? Yes. Luana, thank you, Lynn. Is Luana still here? Yes, I am. Oh, okay, and did you want to share something? Um, yeah, I, I had a hard time answering these questions because um, I didn't grow up in black America or white America. I grew up in a subculture, which is a military uh, community, which is, in an, it's a microcosm. So in and of itself, it's a very different culture. And I didn't grow up in this country. So, um, uh, so there was no discussion about race at my table, at, in my home ever. In fact, probably the most that we've discussed it has been this over the summer, over the pandemic, is, you know, asking my parents um, questions about, you know, their experiences growing up. And even theirs were very unique. My dad grew up in this little, my dad will be 90 next month, and he grew up in a little German community. So he doesn't have, you know, a traditional African-American experience. Um, but where my where my journey has been different, and I'm going to do a spin on racism and prejudice, prejudices, is you can actually be racist and prejudiced against your own race. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and that's because of lack of understanding, lack of exposure. So I wasn't around. I was from, from kindergarten through seventh grade, I was the only black person in my entire school. And then when we moved to Arizona 
as I was telling Trish in the interview, you know, how many black people live in Arizona? Not much. And then I went to the University of Arizona. So, again, 50,000 strong, less than 1% African-American, and half of those were from African, so they weren't even African-American. So my exposure to blacks was when I moved to Atlanta um, 20 years ago. My true, my true indoctrination to what it means to be black in America. And I, I think this has been the greatest experience. I fought <laughs> kicking and screaming coming here because my ex-husband was military. And, you know, all I knew about the South was what I had read in books. And my opinion of blacks was, again, what I had, what had been depicted in books and on TV. Because I come from a, a family of means. So I thought everyone was like that. I lived in a bubble. And then coming here, I realized and started to understand um, the disparity um, among races. I I, I began to become educated on uh, the lack of access. Uh, I I understood truly what the meaning of institutionalized racism means and how laws are built for those who are, are in the governing seat. So if this were an America built by, um, and I'm saying controlled by the African American power and wealth, then the whole paradigm would be switched, flip flop. Um, so I, I, I coming here helped me to truly embrace being a black woman, and and. Not just saying I am, I'm a woman, but I'm a black woman. And because of that, there's, there's, there's good in that. There's power in that. I, I love our ancestry. Yeah, we, were, we came from, from slaves, but my God, we survived. So my story, my passion, my fight has a very different spin. I'm not, I'm not bitter, um, but I do see injustices. And just like Trish, if I see it, I'm going to speak against it. I'm going to fight. Um, and um, I think I've, I've definitely become more accepting of, of Blacks as to their, their, their struggle and why things are the way they are in some cases, and um, not making myself separate. Okay. That makes sense. Because I would say, well, that's, that's them. Well, no, it's we. It's we. I'm, 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 I am part of the black, black community. I am now part of the black experience, and I am so proud of it. But I'm also part of the American experience, and I'm very proud of that as well. That's perfect, Luana. Thank you for sharing that, honey. So we all have different perspectives, don't we? We come from different backgrounds. We come from different belief systems. Is, um, I, I, I kind of want to hear from one other person, like maybe the guys or maybe another person. Uh, for a few seconds here before I go into, I want to give us some tools and some awarenesses and ahas and things that we can go forward with from whatever came up for us and from and some, some things for us to focus on. Uh, does anybody else want to share before I do that? Okay. Um, I hope that, I mean, I could talk like this for a long time, but, you know, I, I feel like whatever experience we've had in our life around Merge. Yeah. I'm sorry. This is Carla Ellis. How are you? Oh, Carla, good. Did you are you are you short on time? Do you have to go for it? We got a minute. Go ahead. Oh, just very quickly. Um, I too grew up military um, on different bases. Nevertheless, my parents did um, one's from North Carolina and one from Alabama. And so they did grow up in a segregated uh, society where they're from, had to go to, to attend HBCUs because couldn't be accepted at um, the other schools and whatnot. But um, one thing I did realize, number one, I've led a shelt very sheltered life. But number two, I also realize sometimes, and I always have to be careful of this, Sometimes people, um, one thing I found is that people, some people can just be jerks and it has, has nothing to do, and it has nothing to do with the color of my skin or anything like that. That's right. Um, and so. There's a lot of people not, uh, 
I don't know if you see How it. you doing? We're all, we're all kind of yeah, I... <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I realized that when I went through, um, uh, was it Passion Manifestation? What was that? The last, huh? Yes, that's, yeah. that's, the graduate, that's the graduate course, yeah. Yeah, and I realized that when I got knocked off the chair, when we were <laughs> doing the thing, realized, Carla, it was not necessarily the color of your skin that yeah. he decided he going to push you off. That's right. But it was, you know what, Carla, and this is was, uh, uh, this was, um, yeah, I do realize that it was um, when somebody else, I think Elisa told me when we were the last three in that thing, she said, Carla, he would have done it if I had, if I had been in your situation. Some people just are not, some people can be jerks, it has nothing to do with the color of your skin. Yeah. That's right. And so it is, you know, and so I have to always be careful of that, but do realize that, yes, racism still does exist. So, you know, and there may be times where I, and I, and sometimes I'll never know, maybe I did not get the job because of my color of my skin. But one thing my mother told me, and I'll close with this, is that Carla, she told me, there is going to be some people who don't hire you because of the color. Oh, we lost you there. It's going to be some employers out there that are going, all they want is what colors. So that's it. No, I get it. I get it. And absolutely, I, I, again, it, there are people that are just jerks that don't know any better. Uh, or maybe they do know better and they do it anyway. And that's the questions I always have. Yeah. But how do you deal with that? How do you deal with those kind of people? And so one of the things I want to share with us is just notice what, what are, you know, what are you focusing on right now around your own prejudice toward other people, your projections and how, when they pay people project onto you, um, you know, my question would be is how do these beliefs serve me? So if you have, if you can identify what your beliefs are, do they serve you? If they don't serve you, let's see how we can shift those beliefs around and how to respond. So one of the things that I tell people is you, to stand up, tell your truth, say it with compassion. And one of the best ways you can talk to somebody, you say, for me, the truth is. And you use those words. For me, the truth is I feel like you're a jerk. Or for me, the truth is that was unnecessary. Or for me, the truth is you might be judging me right now. But that's your issue, not mine. And unfortunately, many people take it on as their own issue. When they get judged, they take it on and they say, oh, there's something wrong with me. So the, the affirmation that I have for all of us is to say, I am safe and loved and I matter. So if when people judge us for whatever reason, okay, or when they attack us, that's their issue, not ours. It, it becomes ours if we take it on and think there's something wrong with me. Okay, so one of the responses would be, I'm safe, I'm loved, I, I matter. That's an affirmation that you can use. But to use the terms for me, the truth is. And the thing I want to close, uh, the thing I want to share with us is, you know, I've been a proponent for all peoples in my life, including black, brown, all colors of the rainbow, women, sexual orientation, child abuse, you children, cultural and social complacency in so many places I've been around in the world. And the thing that I've noticed is that really we are one humanity. And as a light worker, that's what I call myself. I choose peace and rise above all the hate. And yet, I understand the pain. I understand the outrage. I can never fully appreciate being a white woman in this world and what it means to be persecuted for my skin. Okay? Now, as a white woman, I have suffered prejudice of being a bitch. I've been called a bitch. I've had victim of violence. I've had to work harder than a man to earn respect. As well as I've also enjoyed doors being opened and, and having a sense of privilege. I've enjoyed that. 
However, as an American, I have never experienced that hatred or devalued because of my skin. And I have felt others being jealous of my position, but never felt that I had to prove myself worthy of life itself. I never had to teach my son to be afraid of the system. Okay, so when I taught in Malaysia and worked with Chinese young girls, um, they were told they weren't, they weren't worthy enough to live. They killed them there. And many were killed at birth as a systemized act of that culture. And so that belief system has been handed down. And so the ones that I dealt with felt worthless and second class. And the Muslims that I taught over there in other countries, they treat women as second class and not as important as men based on their religious doctrines. So no matter what our beliefs are, there are inherent fears that permeate our consciousness of people that are not like us. That's what I feel. These fears are handed down from generation to generation until it is awakened and stopped. And so I'm encouraging us to reach out, whether you're a white male, black male, whatever, whatever you are, <laughs> to reach out to our brothers and our sisters on this planet and give a hand in peace and compassion and empathy. And that is what's gonna shift it for us, is to really turn up the empathy, turn on the compassion for ourselves and others. This is what we stand for and ask yourself, am I willing to do whatever it takes to break free? Am I willing? And I think the reckoning and the awareness that's happening, it's an awakening. It's a symbol of a culmination of so much anxiety and fear in the world right now and in so many ways. And it really pains me to know that we have to sink to such lows sometimes in our hum humanness and have so much grief to make us aware of what is most precious to us all, our lives and our compassion. And I think that is our key is to really turn up the compassion and I encourage all of us to be a champion of supporting, getting out of our comfort zone, okay? Getting out of your comfort zone for growth. That's what my purpose has been to push people. <laughs> it's through love and support, but supporting people to know, you know, that, they're, that they make a difference, they matter and they're important. And supporting people who are not seen and not heard. And so the essence of communication is being vulnerable telling your truth and showing up and actively listening to other people to resolve conflicts. And it can get messy. And all upsets are opportunities to know the truth. So sometimes being vulnerable like this scares people, but there is a safety in telling your truth with compassion and a depth of living with contribution, integrity, and consciousness. So I encourage us all to just hold that space with each other because we are creating a global movement of conscious leaders empowering others to create a win-win world. And I see my conscious leaders <laughs> out there. They're going, yes, with our Conscious Leadership Academy. So I appreciate you guys coming. I want to just... Um, um, you'll get a recording of this, by the way, uh, tomorrow, so you'll have it, and you can maybe go a little deeper into, there's so much, so much more we could go into, but we only have an hour or so, um, and I encourage you to join me in a real workshop, a virtual, well, not real, it's going to be virtual, but it's July 25th, it's the essence of abundance, and July 26th is the essence of relationships, and there's going to be a five-hour workshop online with Zoom, and we're going to go into all kinds of cool stuff. So if you go to essenceofbeing.com slash EOA stands for essence of abundance or essenceofbeing.com slash EOR, which stands for essence of relationships, essenceofbeing.com slash EOA or EOR. And you can go there and find out more. It's July 25th and 26th. I invite you to come play with us. Um, it's going to, and it's a, we can really dive deep into relationships and abundance. Okay. You can do both of them or one of them. I invite you to come. And the next power hour that we're going to have in August is August 19th. Remember it's the third Wednesday of every month that I do these. And the next one's going to be essence of leadership. 
So I think we need to really look at some leadership right now. <laughs> okay, and how we can stand out and be a leader in the world. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to unmute everybody. Oh, well, I tried to. If you want to unmute yourself, everybody can, anybody want to share anything else? Bird, thank you so much for having this conversation. Every time we have conversations like this, it chips away and creates new awareness for all of us. So thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, Trish. I appreciate you too, hon. You know I do. My pleasure. So if anybody wants to say anything else or share? I'd just like to say thank you so much for your courage uh, to, to open this up, to put this out there. Uh, some people, when they attempt to be courageous, actually find that they lose family and friends. And so I really appreciate your courage for standing up and, and having the conversation because this is the only way we're going to get to the other side is with this dialogue. So thank you. My pleasure and my purpose for sure. Thank you. All right. So join me next time in August and please come play with me for the abundance class or the relationship class. It's going to be a five hour workshop. We're going to play and have fun, but we're also going to shift some things. Okay. So remember, I am safe. I am loved. And I matter. And I matter. Yes, yes, yes. All right. All right. Thank and you. I'm excited to be coming to the relationship course. Yay. Trish, I know. Finally. It feels so awesome. Finally. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Bye -bye. I like everything else we've done, so yeah, this will be fun. Yep. Thank you, Burge. Thank you. Thanks, Burge. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.